Good morning. Happy Friday. Really cool to have you here. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, uh, and I sure appreciate your hard work this week. Uh, Monday at 1.10, uh, when you come to lab, we'll look at problem set number four, uh, which is mostly grams to moles to moles to grams kind of things like we're doing right now. Quiz four will follow. Uh, quiz four only has stuff from this particular chapter, what I call chapter four, part one. We will start chapter four, part two in a little bit, which is solutions, but quiz four won't be over solutions. All right, it's only grams to moles to moles to grams. Uh, turn in the percent potassium chloride lab we did last Monday. Um, the rough draft class presentation paper is due on Monday, and I've had a lot of questions, and I want to go over that a little bit again. Uh, rough draft for me means three things, all right? Number one is that you have at least two typed pages of work. It can be not really well put together, it can be random, the stuff that goes in there, but at least two typed pages. I want to see that you're working on it, thinking about it, stuff like that. Typed, yep, typed. Number two, there is a rough draft cover sheet, all right? It's a special cover sheet. It was in the syllabus, and you can also find it online. Uh, make sure that is stapled to the top. It's got dates and stuff. All the versions have been fixed, by the way, Luke, thank you. Uh, anyway, but make sure that's there too. And then the third thing is you need to turn in the abstract only of a peer-reviewed science article. All of your elements are being studied a lot by scientists around the world. And I want you to know that there's active research going on. So if you go to the class presentation, frequently asked questions, there's a link to the library. Uh, you can look up all kinds of these articles. All I want for you to literally is copy and paste the abstract and the citation so I can go back and look at it. You don't, I don't want the whole article. I'll mark, I'll mark you down if you include the whole article. I just want the abstract, all right? That way it'll show that what's going on. So again, two typed pages, the cover page, peer-reviewed science abstract. I'm hoping it's not too big of a deal. Any questions on that? Um, peer review, is it like online? Is it like a discussion post? So uh, you'll go to the Mount Hood Library's website, look in the class presentation, frequently asked questions, or email me and I'll send it to you. And you can log in there and it's good. If you do it on campus, you don't even have to log in. If you do it away from campus, you have to use your Mount Hood I saw somebody else. Can you answer my question? Sure. Okay, good. Okay. Other questions? Cool. All right. On Wednesday, we left off with this example. When you think of all the millions and millions of compounds that are known, more than 90% of them are organic chemistry. And of those 90% of all the compounds known compounds, a huge majority are compounds with not just carbon and hydrogen, like we talked about on Wednesday, but carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This includes things you've probably heard of, like alcohols. Alcohol is more than just drinking. Just say no, kids, but there's more to alcohols. There's actually a family of them out there. Um, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, a lot of names that you'll start to hear if you go on in chemistry, all have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them. So what we're doing right now is looking at an approach to analyze what kind of hydrocarbon you have where the hydrocarbon has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, on Wednesday, we saw how you can take these organic things and you heat them up in a combustion reaction and you make water and CO2. And the water leads to how many hydrogens you have. So here's an example of what we did on Wednesday. We took the grams of water, turned it into moles using the molar mass. Water has two hydrogens, so it's two moles of hydrogen per one mole of water, and we got the moles of hydrogen. And down here, we did the same thing with the carbon from carbon dioxide. You can take the grams of CO2, turn it into moles of CO2, Carbon dioxide has one carbon, so one mole of carbon comes from one mole of CO2. We got the moles of carbon. And if your compound has just carbon and hydrogen, like we saw on Wednesday, then you use these two numbers, you can compare them, find the empirical formula, and you're good to go. But oxygen is a little bit more troublesome because oxygen is in CO2, it's in the water, it's in the original compound, in this case, caproic acid, and it's also in the oxygen we use to combust it. So it's all over the place. 
So the extension we do here is once you have moles of hydrogen, for example, you need to turn it into grams of hydrogen, all right? So the moles of hydrogen times the molar mass of hydrogen, 1.01 grams per mole, 0 0.0469 grams of hydrogen. And that's all the hydrogen in this reaction. And the same thing down here, but for carbon, right? We took the moles of carbon, turned it into grams of carbon, 0.2791 grams of uh, carbon. And the reason we're doing this is because if you know how much sample you started with, and we do in this problem, 0 0.450 grams, that represents all of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in the whole sample. All right, the oxygen was added in, but all the carbon, all the hydrogen, and all the oxygen in the sample comes from this number right here. So another thing we talked about this week was law of mass action, which is also known as law of conservation of mass. Same thing, just different names. And all it means is chemists need to account for all the matter that goes in equals all the matter that comes out. All right, we're accountants on this level. We need to make sure that every gram and atom is taken care of. So if we know grams of carbon, grams of hydrogen, and we know how much grams carbon, hydrogen, oxygen the sample had to begin with, we can use this number, subtract these two numbers to find how much grams of oxygen was just in the sample, all right? Not the grams from the O2 or anything like that. This is just the grams of the oxygen in the sample. So on this next page, what we're doing here is we're taking the whole mass of the sample and we're subtracting the grams of H and C that we calculated on the last page. And these two numbers are less than the total. And the difference, which in this case is 0.124 grams, that represents the oxygen in the caprylic acid. It's not the oxygen from the O2. We don't care about that. We are trying to find the formula for the CHO. And if you can find the grams of oxygen from just the sample, you're good to go. So in this example, this is a lot different than the other formulas we've seen, okay? We found, we found the grams of CO2 and grams of water, turned them into moles, turned them into moles of C and H, and then turned those into grams of C and grams of H. And you subtract those from the total sample, which in this case was 0 0.450 grams, to get the grams of oxygen in this caproic acid sample. Any questions on that? Yes? Um, can we find the slides on the website? Yes, definitely. They're on the website and they're also in the companion. You bet. If you can't find them, you let me know. So. There's a lot of things to write down, so I do recommend. All right, so once you have the grams of oxygen in the sample, we can turn that into moles of oxygen. So we're taking the grams of oxygen in the caproic acid, turning it into moles of oxygen. Oxygen is about 16 grams per mole, 0 0.00775 moles of oxygen. And now we have the moles of oxygen. On the previous page, we had moles of carbon and moles of hydrogen. Now we can start comparing moles to find empirical formulas and all that jazz. So if you take this new version, the moles of oxygen, here's the moles of hydrogen we calculated, here's the moles of carbon. You can now divide all of those numbers by the smallest number, and 0 0.00775 is certainly the smallest. So that divided by itself is one. 0 0.0464 divided by the oxygen comes out to be six, and this divided by that number comes out to be three. So our empirical formula for caproic acid, C3H6O, and that's pretty awesome. <clears throat> now, in this problem, I also gave you the molar mass of the whole compound. So if you wanted to find the molecular formula, which is what chemists are always after, you can add up three carbons, three times 12, six hydrogens, six times one, and one oxygen, one times 16, it comes out to be about 58 grams per mole. And if you compare that to the molar mass of the whole thing, whole thing divided by empirical formula molar mass will always give you a whole number. 
And you can probably see that 116 divided by 58, about two. These are always going to be whole numbers. So your molecular formula will be the empirical formula taken twice, C6H12O2. So at this point, it may not feel like it because it's Friday, I know, and this is weird stuff, but you should pat yourself on the back because now you can find empirical and molecular formulas through two routes, all right? Normally, things are done through elemental percentages. That's real common, especially when you have metals and stuff. However, these crazy organic things, they a lot of times will use combustion reactions. They'll collect the CO2 in the water. And if you know this kind of process, you can find empirical and molecular formulas for them too. So, two ways to find formulas. So, uh, I never fully understood the molecular formula and the point of it. So I understand like, you multiply the elements by two, so you have C3, so three atoms, three molecules of atom of carbon, I'm sorry. And you just multiply that by two and you pretty much have two compounds. So what's really the whole point of that? So look back in chapter two, part two, all right. But some compounds like H2O2, that's the molecule, that's what it's like in the real world. But if you divide both of those numbers by two, you get the empirical formula, HO, and percentages and this way of CO2 and water always gives you like the HO version of H2O2. It's not the big picture, all right? And chemists want the big picture. So if you know the empirical formula, take all those together to get the empirical formulas, molar mass. And if you have the molar mass of the whole thing, you'll get a ratio and that ratio will always be a whole number. H2O2 relative to HO, the ratio would be two. And in this problem, it's also two. 116 divided by 58 is two. So you need two of these to get this, just like you need two HOs to get H2O2. That's a very fast overview. Uh, look back at the earlier sections and stuff to make sure you're good to go. So, but yeah, that's kind of the big picture here. And what it comes down to at the end of the day is that chemists just wanna know what we're dealing with, <laughs> all right? And knowing HO, isn't always enough. Uh, just like if we knew C3H6O, like that wouldn't be enough, all right? We just want to know what the molecule is. What if uh, you get the critical formula that looks exactly like the molecular, do they just simplify it and that turns into molecular? It can, like water would be an example of that. Um, sometimes that's the case, but you need two experiments, and that's the big thing. Uh, look back in chapter two, part two. All right, definitely look that part over, man. That's, that's going to be important for what we're going through because chemists are always trying to find form. Okay. Cool. Other questions? All right. So that's it for chapter four, part one. All right. And the big thing of chapter four, part one was learning about the power of the chemical reaction. All right. And we can use the chemical reaction in this last example to find the empirical molecular formulas of these weird organic compounds. But most of the time in chemistry, we deal uh, not with solids, but with solutions. And so this next section uh, is just talking about another big part of chemistry, <laughs> big surprise, uh, which is called a solution, all right? And a solution is uh, what we dealt with in the eight bottles lab almost exclusively. You added chemicals from droppers, all right? They looked like liquids, but there was something inside them. And you can think about it as the difference between regular water and like sugar water, all right? You drink sugar water, it's a lot different than regular water, obviously. The sugar in the water has an effect, all right? And if you had salt water instead of sugar water, that would be different too. Salt water and sugar water are solutions. You've got something running around, the water in this case, uh, to make it happen. So solutions, super important when it comes to chemistry. Some solutions will make, uh, can conduct electricity. So this little picture right here shows a solution. They've got some electric leads through it. This is something in physics is talked about. Solutions sometimes will conduct electricity. You can plug it through, make light bulbs go on. But this is also a solution, and this one doesn't make the light bulb come on. 
So we're going to see a lot more in this reaction, on uh, this section, excuse me, about how uh, solutions can make the chemist's life easier. I call this chapter four, part two. It has a little bit of chapter three and a little bit of chapter four. Let's check it out. Solutions always have a solvent and a solute. And it's unfortunate in my chemistry world that all of these begin with SOL. <laughs> and you might have another interpretation of SOL. Yes, if you're smiling, this is a G-rated class, so I don't want to say it out loud. But uh, SOL can mean lots of things. And knowing which SOL you have, super important, or else you will be SOL. <laughs> anyway, so solution is solvent plus solute, all right? In my sugar solution, I talked about a little bit ago, sugar would be the solute and water would be the solvent. Now the official definition, which is kind of boring, is that the solvent is the component, i.e. sugar and water, that comes together, then that state is preserved when the solution forms. So water is a liquid, and a sugar solution looks like water, all right? So it looks like a liquid, all right? Solute is the other solution component. I prefer to think about a solution as being an exciting part and then the part that delivers the exciting part. So in a sugar solution, sugar is exciting. Water, I mean, it's water's cool, don't get me wrong, but sugar is what makes the sugar solution. You'd expect that kind of sweet taste when you taste it. So the solute is the more exciting part and the solvent is just the bulk part that delivers the exciting part. So a salt solution, the solute would be sodium chloride probably, the solvent would be water, and salt plus water makes the solution. Now, in a solution, the compounds must be soluble. This is a new term we're using too. Soluble just means you put them together and all of the solid dissolves. If you have an insoluble solution, it's a different ballgame because then you're gonna have little solid pieces running around. And in this section, we're mostly dealing with soluble solutions, which means that this, we put the solid in and every, we did stir it up a little bit and it dissolves. How do we know when things are soluble, Dr. Russell? Oh, good question in the back of the room. Actually, David has a question. I should shut up here. Um, with, so if you're mixing just two liquids together, obviously you're not mixing a solid and a liquid, but it, Mixing of liquid be considered soluble? We're mostly going to look in this section at taking solids and putting them in liquids. Okay. But in reality, David, you can have a gas in a liquid, or you can have a solid in a solid, or any combination, stuff like that. We will focus more on those in Chem 222. Um, this is the most common kind, all right, where you have like a solid that's being placed usually in water and stuff like that. But yeah, you hold on to that idea because that's an important part too. Um, so, like David said, the important part in this section is usually going to be solids placed in water. And there are other exceptions, so his question was right on. Uh, we need to know when things are soluble, when they dissolve, and when they're insoluble, when they don't dissolve. And this guide is going to be something that we'll, we'll use all the way through Chem 223. It's in the net ionics lab that we'll talk about next week, but I wanna talk about how this thing works. So soluble solutions are the ones we're gonna be using. They have the properties that the insoluble don't. So in this, in this solubility guide, and by the way, online, you'll find a gazillion other ones, please use our solubility guide so we all have the same uh, answers. But anyway, the soluble compounds, the ones that dissolve in water, will be the upper left and the lower right. And the ones that don't dissolve, the ones that are insoluble, that don't really make solutions, are in the upper right and the lower left. So soluble, soluble, insoluble, insoluble. So here are some examples of how to tell if something is soluble or insoluble. These are three barium compounds. If I asked you if barium nitrate dissolves in water, which means AQ right there, what you can do is look on this chart. Now, 
barium doesn't show up too many places, but please notice here how these are soluble and there's no exceptions on this side. All right, there's exceptions down here, but there's no exceptions. And what that means, anything with one of these ions, always soluble. Jonah goes on and gets a PhD in organometallic chemistry. And he comes back and says, oh, Dr. Russell, I'm making blah, 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 nitrate. And I haven't done organometallic chemistry for a while. So I'm like, oh, yeah, Jonah, that's cool. I don't know what blah, blah is, but I do know that nitrate's on this list. Water soluble. Anything with nitrate is going to be water soluble. Same thing with sodium, potassium, ammonium, chlorate, acetate, always soluble. So. Barium isn't listed too many places on here, but nitrate is. Nitrate's one of the magic ones. Nitrate's always soluble, no exceptions. We're going to put an AQ next to that one. That dissolves in water. Now, barium chloride. Chloride is one of these right here. Chloride, bromide, and iodide ions usually are soluble, but there are three exceptions. Silver, the weird mercury 2, 2 plus, and lead 2 plus. So chloride, usually soluble, unless it's with silver, mercury, or lead. Barium is not silver, mercury, or lead. We would say that barium chloride dissolves in water. It's not one of the exceptions. Most chlorides, bromides, and iodides are water soluble. This one will be AQ. However, barium sulfate, all right, if I go down, here's sulfate. Most sulfates are water soluble, but there are some exceptions. And lo and behold, there's barium. So that means that barium sulfide, unlike most sulfates, barium sulfate will be insoluble. You should write this as BASO4 with a solid. It doesn't get along well with water. These are all insoluble with them exceptions. And the exceptions are usually alkali metals. Which group on the periodic table are the alkali metals? Excellent, first column, nice job. These right here, lithium, sodium, potassium, et cetera. So if you have lithium carbonate, carbonate's usually insoluble, gonna be an exception, it's gonna be AQ. So soluble with a few insoluble exceptions, insoluble, which means solid, with a few soluble exceptions. All right, Gabriel, I saw your hand. When we're talking about um, unsoluble, uh -huh. is it like different forms of unsolubility, like hydrophobic on different, tem different existing liquid temperatures and such? Right on. So you have brought up two cool points there. Uh, temperature. Uh, these are pretty much just room temperature right now, but we will in Chem 223 talk about the changes of temperature, and you bet you can make things more and less soluble by affecting the temperature. So think about these as like just room temperature. And hydrophobic, yeah, I would say that the insoluble ones were more hydrophobic and the soluble ones were more hydrophilic. This is a little bit simpler uh, than they use for those terms usually, but the, but the process this would apply. I'm going to blind that bottom box on the lower mm -hmm. insoluble. Does that say all metals? It says most metal hydroxides and oxides. Okay. And yeah, that's okay to ask that, ma'am. Um, again, this chart is in your net ionics lab and you can find the notes and stuff. But yeah, so what that means is that if you had barium hydroxide, barium would be an insoluble hydroxide. But sodium hydroxide, sodium is an alkali metal, sodium hydroxide would be AQ. Okay. I don't know if we mentioned this. I'll probably space it out. Um, it's okay. What's with the AQ and S after thing here? These are uh, terms used for chemical reactions. AQ means it dissolves in water, and S would mean it doesn't dissolve in water, it will stay a solid. So for what we're talking about, really cool to know when you have a solution. These would be solutions up here, but this one would not make a solution. It would stay as a sum. That was a good question. Other questions? That list is kind of funky, so I'd like to give you my quick and dirty, Michael's quick and dirty. And for more than 90% of the things we're going to look at, if you know this list, you'll be pretty good. Sodium, potassium, lithium, ammonium, positive. Nitrate, chlorate, perchlorate, and acetate, always AQ. 
and most of the time, chloride, bromide, and iodide, or AQ, we're gonna run into these exceptions a lot in future lectures. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But most of the time they're soluble, and most of the time, crazy sul sulfate's soluble too. Barium sulfate is one we're gonna run into once in a while that's not. So just be aware that if this is intimidating, I understand at first it's a little weird, this will get you through more than 90% of the time. All right, still have this table around, but more than 90%. Yeah, like, will you, uh, are we gonna have to memorize that table? This would be a cool thing maybe to put on your uh, cheat sheet, man. Okay. So you know cheat and stuff? Yeah, that's right. That would be a good thing. Okay. So here's a question you might see, and it says, which is the only insoluble salt in water? Now, on the full version of the sheet right here, the insoluble ones are the upper right and the lower left, while the soluble ones are the upper left and the lower right. So let's look at ammonium nitrate first of all, all right? Well, ammonium is right here and nitrates right there. So what do you think ammonium nitrate is going to be? Soluble or insoluble? Soluble. Well done. It can be ammonium blah, 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 and it can be blah, blah, nitrate. Doesn't matter. Ammonium and nitrate both on this list. Always soluble. Always a Q. So this is going to be soluble. Now hydroxides, like Donnie asked about earlier, hydroxides are usually insoluble, but the alkali metals, sodium, <clears throat> potassium, lithium, also AQ. So this one should be soluble. All right, most hydroxides are insoluble, but not the alkali metals like sodium. But this crazy one, PBI2, iodide, bromide and chloride, usually soluble, lead two plus is one of the exceptions. And so that one would be the insoluble compound. Most chloride, bromides, and iodides are okay, but not lead, mercury, and the weird mercury 2,2 two plus ion. Um, if you go down this list, potassium and lithium boast our alkali metals, so they're going to be soluble all the time, just like chlorate, acetate. Cool. Now, let's go back to what Gabriel asked about. You start playing with temperature, these rule, this rules have to throw out the window. There's more to temperature, and we'll talk about that in Chem 223. But most of the time, uh, here at Mount Hood, these rules work really well. All right, that's why we're going through all that stuff, so. Okay. Potassium for manganate is an ionic compound. It dissolves readily when mixed with water. Dissolution involves the breaking of the bonds that hold the compound together. The ions become distributed throughout the water, forming a solution. Water molecules are made of hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen side of the molecule has a positive charge. The oxygen side is negative. When water molecules contact an ionic compound, such as potassium permanganate, their positive sides are attracted to the negative ions of the compound, and the negative sides of the H2O are attracted to the positive ions in the compound. These attractions allow the crystal lattice to break down, and the compound dissolves. So first of all, if you add a solid to water and it dissolves, you'll see all the solid go away. And this isn't the ultimate video by any means, but this uh, became a purple solution. You had the purple solid, it was placed in water, you stir it up a little bit, it becomes, looks like a Kool-Aid. Don't drink it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, this is how you can see if there's a solution. You could add sugar, you could add salt water, dissolve it up and stuff, it would also become a solution. So if you have an aqueous solution, there's no solid left, all right? If you saw some solid at the bottom, it would be insoluble, and that's when you'd write the S next to it. Now, if your compound is ionic, when you have a metal and a non-metal, or a cation and an anion, something really cool happens with water. And in this picture right here, it shows how water comes up to the crystal lattice. Now remember that ionic bonds, super strong, hard to break, high melting points, all that kind of stuff. But water has kind of a V-like shape right there, and we'll see this in Chem 222. Um, the, this side of the V, the point of the V, is actually a little bit more negative. 
and the inside part of the V is a little bit more positive. So what happens is in KMNO4, you've got big positive K. This is the MNO4 permanganate ion. This is negative, this is positive. So when water comes around, the negative side is attracted to the cation from the positive side. But this side, which is slightly positive, is attracted to the anions. So water is able to break up ionic compounds better than any other compound I know. It's amazing how it does it. So you end up with individual ions floating around in solution. So earlier on we talked about how AQ means dissolved in water. When you have an ionic compound, the cation and the anion dissociate. So you end up with K plus and MnO4 minus ions. And the AQ just represents how the water has pulled them away from their lats. This has a real interesting property when it comes to solutions. <clears throat> because what you can do is you can put electricity through it and if the electricity is created, if it makes a current, which means that you have like a little racetrack of electrons running around, whoa, then you can have light bulbs turn on and all kinds of neat things. Once in a while you've heard how if you're taking a bath, you shouldn't have like electricity things next to you because if electricity, like a hair dryer goes in, electrocution, it's really not the water's fault. Uh, water, as we're gonna see later in a future course, uh, water doesn't conduct electricity at all but our bodies have all kinds of ions on it, sodium, chlorides, and stuff like that. It gets in the water, and it makes these solutions, these little positives and negatives run around. So the electricity flows through the solution, which is just contaminated by your bodies. Uh, that's the part that causes trouble if you drop your hair dryer in the bathtub. But anyway, <clears throat> This is an example, KMNO4 and all these electrolytes, excuse me, all these things are examples of electrolytes. Electrolyte doesn't mean you're drinking Gatorade. <laughs> it means it's a solution that conducts electricity. And if you have a metal and a non-metal, a cation and an anion, almost all the time they will conduct electricity and they'll be electrolytes. You can actually see it by plugging it in. Here's a copper two chloride in water, makes kind of a neat blue color. But anyway, the copper two chloride is also an electrolyte. It will conduct electricity. So, backtrack. Electrolytes uh, are not just things in Gatorade. <laughs> They're actually solutions that can conduct electricity. And they are solutions that conduct electricity if there's a cation and an anion, an H plus and a Cl minus, an Mg2 plus and Cl minus, anything like that, all right? If it dissolves in water, then it's going to make an electrolyte. And there's some really kind of neat properties about that. So KMNO4, NaCl, HCl, CuCl2, when they're placed in water, all of a sudden the cations and the anions break up. They can't stand each other, <laughs> whatever interpretation you want to use. But they do dissociate into the ions, which is a real interesting phenomenon as we're going to see here. A strong electrolyte is a compound that ionizes completely in solution. Hydrogen chloride breaks into hydrogen and chlorine ions. This is an example of hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is one of the strongest acids we'll see here in a little bit. They, they also dissociate into the ions. So the H plus and the Cl minus go their separate ways. In the nomenclature lab, I made a big deal of hydrogen monochloride, which was HCl in the gas form, versus hydrochloric acid, HCl in the aqueous form. And this is why HCl in water is a whole different species than HCl as a gas. HCl in water gives a lot of energy. This is acids being acid. HCl in the gas form actually is quite different. It has a lot of different properties. As long as you keep it away from water, HCl as a gas is definitely something that's quite different. Hydrochloric acid, you wouldn't want to put your hand into necessarily. If your hand was dry, and that might be hard to do, by the way, but if your hand was, you could in theory put it in hydrogen monochloride and it would be okay. 
So this electrolyte thing is really important. A lot of times the reactivity of chemicals a lot different when you place it in solution than when you have it in the solid phase or in this case, the gas phase. A weak electrolyte is a compound that only partially ionizes in solution. Some hydrogen ions dissociate from acetic acid molecules, but others may rebond at the same time. Now, this is an example of a compound that dissociates a little bit. And roughly this one, this is, uh, by the way, acetic acid, which is the active ingredient in vinegar. Uh, vinegar dissociates a little bit into an H plus and the acetate ion. So acetate plus H plus makes acetic acid. This is another thing from it. Now, if you're going to drink an acid, <laughs> drink acetic acid, because normally, under normal conditions, acetic acid is weak. It doesn't make as much of the dissociate parts. HCl, oh man, that's a hunter killer. You drink that, right? Bad news. So this is, don't drink any acids, don't drink anything in the lab, period. But, uh, all right, prop that back on there for a little bit. But anyway, weak electrolytes don't break up as much. So they don't have the same kind of power, usually, as the strong electrolytes do. And finally, oh, by the way, you can see that the light bulb is just barely on for this one. But then there's also what they call non-electrolytes. These compounds are covalent. They don't have positives and negatives in them. And if they don't have positives and negatives, cations and anions, they're not going to break up into pieces and you're not going to have electricity go through. Some compounds that dissolve in water, such as ethanol, do not dissociate into ions at all. Such compounds are called non-electrolytes. Ethanol has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Sugar has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These kind of things will dissolve in water, but they don't break up into positives, negatives. So when you put electricity through them, nothing happens. There's no positives and negatives to make the electricity go through. So to summarize what we're seeing here, all right, if a compound dissolves in water, we can use that table most of the time to figure out when things are aqueous and solids. And the aqueous ones are the soluble ones. For the soluble compounds, we can then further break them down into strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, and non-electrolytes. The strong electrolytes will conduct electricity really well. They have a lot different kind of reactivity than the other ones do. Non-electrolytes are almost always covalent. Sugar, ethanol, DNA actually dissolves in water. Those things will dissolve in water, but they don't conduct electricity. They're not electrolytic. And then there are a few weak electrolytes. Um, those are, we'll talk about those in a little bit. They conduct electricity a little bit, but they're not quite as powerful as the other ones. Questions? Now, <clears throat> acids uh, are gonna be super important to us coming up. And acids can be strong and acids can be weak. And the way that strong and weak comes from is what they're like in solution. So all strong acids are strong electrolytes. That means that when you place them in water, they break up 100%. And we're going to see that that little H plus is why an acid is an acid. It's what gives it kind of its power. Acids uh, are super important for chemistry. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. The compound hydrogen chloride ionizes completely, so many ions are free in the solution. Again, you have to have water, all right? Hydrogen chloride without water stays hydrogen monochloride. They called it hydrogen chloride there. I, I will let it pass. But anyway, it's not the same thing. It doesn't have that H+, which makes acid acids. A water molecule consists of two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Water molecules are attracted to a hydrogen ion, or proton, to form a conglomeration. There are often six and sometimes more water molecules around an ion. Because the hydrogen ion is so small, it is thought to have an average of four water molecules associated with it at any time. Normal hydrogen ions aren't that exciting. But when you place the hydrogen ions in water, the H plus dissociates and connects to the water. 
Um, earlier I said how there's waters like a V shape. The top of the V, this part right here, is slightly negative. So if you have a slightly positive H+, plus, there's actually a connection that can be made. And that's what this video is trying to show. Like this is the negative part of water connecting to that part right there. Um, hydronium ion is the fancy name for what makes an acid an acid. And the hydronium ion is a great source of energy. Uh, a lot of things you can do with hydronium ions that you couldn't do otherwise. So the chloride of HCl honestly is pretty boring. All right, it goes off and does its own thing. But the H plus, when it reacts with water, makes this hydronium. And that's when you start having some interesting kind of stuff being happen. Hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid because it only partially ionizes. At any one moment, most of the HF molecules have not split into their ions. Now, the really wild thing about acids, if you haven't heard about this before, is that most of the food and uh, stuff we drink, uh, that we consume daily, most of it's acidic, all right? Ah, you know, oh man, eating a banana. All right, we expect like oranges and stuff to be acidic, I think, because you hear about citric stuff, but, but most of the foods and the, and the liquids we drink, most of them are actually acidic. So there are literally thousands upon thousands of acids. But fortunately for us as human beings, most of them are weak electrolytes which means that maybe of every 10,000 molecules of acetic acid, one of them will break up into H plus and acetate, but the other ones kind of stay the same. Uh, carbonic acid, hydrofluoric acid, phosphoric acid, there's tons and tons and tons of these out there. One thing that will be very helpful for you coming up is if you know the five strong acids. HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, and HClO4. There are five strong acids, all right? And you're like, oh boy, that's really helpful. Yeah, right, uh-huh, Russell. Well, there's thousands upon thousands of acids. And everything else, as far as you're concerned, unless I give you specific instructions otherwise, everything else you can consider to be weak. So carbonic acid, all right, whoa, whoopee-doo, it's in our blood and stuff like that. But anyway, weak acid, it's not on this list, all right? Jeez, uh, uh, we talked about uh, caproic acid earlier at the beginning of this lecture. Caproic acid, not on this list, that's going to be a weak acid. Yeah, I thought sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid, we'll talk about in Chem 223, sulfuric acid has two H pluses. And the first one is as strong as any of these up there, absolutely. But the second one is a stronger, weak acid. And in terms of what we do in chemistry, it does some really weird things. Um, so I'm not gonna make you think about sulfuric acid. We will talk about it in Chem 223 and why it's not on this list. But the first one is as acidic as you get. And there's more sulfuric acid than like anything else. It's used in fertilizers and stuff. But in terms of the stuff we're talking about, it's a troublesome entity. So we'll, we will talk about that more, but you don't need to worry about it right now. Good, that's what you move on. There are other strong acids definitely out there, but they're not as common, or like in this case, they're weird. <laughs> and we'll talk about that more later. Bases. Acids and bases are like yin to yang. If you've seen the symbol of the circle with the white and the black on both sides, Acids and bases, man, it's like the perfect symbolization. Acids and bases complement each other and they also provide a lot of energy. Now, just like acids provide energy, bases provide energy as well. Bases are almost always metal hydroxides and the most classic one of all, definitely sodium hydroxide. Now, if you take sodium hydroxide and you place it in water, remember anything with sodium, potassium, lithium, always AQ. And because it's AQ, it's gonna break up into the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion. We don't really care about the sodium part, but man, that hydroxide, that is powerful stuff. NaOH, sodium hydroxide, is a strong base because it dissociates completely. In aqueous solution, it breaks into sodium cations and hydroxide anions. 
strong bases are strong electrolytes, just like the strong acids are strong electrolytes. There are three strong bases that will help you if you know them, and fortunately only three. Sodium hydroxide, which by the way is Drano if you ever used it on drains, calcium hydroxide, and lithium hydroxide. Yes, there are other strong bases, definitely, but these three are the one that we're gonna pop in. And what this means, once again, is that there's thousands and thousands of bases, but all the other ones, unless I tell you explicitly, will be weak. Is lye one of those? Lye is sodium hydroxide, I believe. Yeah, that's right. That's like a classic name and stuff for it. Just like water, you know, dihydrogen monoxide. Good call. On the left is H2O, water. On the right is NH3, ammonia. The dots and lines represent electrons. Ammonia acts as a base in water. It removes a hydrogen ion from water to create hydroxide and ammonium ions. In solutions, only a few hydroxide ions are created at any one time. So ammonia is a weak base. Ammonia and ammonium sound very similar, and I apologize for that on behalf of all chemists everywhere. But the reason they sound familiar is that they are related. If you take some ammonia and you add it to water, you end up making ammonium and hydroxide. And if you have a source of hydroxide, you have a base. This is an example, though, of a weak base, all right? It doesn't break up as much as sodium, potassium, and lithium hydroxide. About 10,000 molecules of NH3 make one hydroxide. It doesn't break down as much. This is a type of thing we'll talk about in Chem 223, which is equilibrium, and we'll talk more about that later. But again, if you know that these three strong bases are out there, then you're good to go, and all the other bases should be weak. So here's just a list of different acids and bases, and this is by all means not comprehensive. But again, if you know the five strong acids and the three strong bases, then everything else for our purposes will be weak, all right? So you may not have heard of tartaric acid, which is okay, I have not used it before either. Um, weak acid, all right? Citric acid in fruits and stuff like that, weak acid. Aspirin. <laughs> anyway, all of these kind of things around us and stuff uh, are gonna be weak acids. These are the strong ones you know, and if you know them, you're fully good to go. Oh, cool, sorry. So this is a question you might see. It says, which of the compounds below is not an acid in aqueous solution? Now, if it's a, a formula that I respect, let's be honest, um, hydrogen is listed first if it's an acid, all right? So if you look at this list, B, D, and E, phosphoric acid, hydrochloric acid, and hypoiodous acid is the name of those. All of those list the H first, and those are definitely going to be acids. So B, D, and E wouldn't be acids uh, if the H was listed first. Sorry, they, if the H is listed first, they're gonna be an acid. But A and C don't have the hydrogen listed first, and this is kind of common. Uh, one of those was a base. Does anybody remember which one? NH3, outstanding. NH3 is a base, all right, just realized. Acetic acid, fascist acid, I swear. Anyway, it sometimes lists the H at the end, and it's not the way that I would like as your chemistry instructor to, for you to think about it, but it is very common to see it that way. Um, just know that NH3 is a real common base. Questions? I'm gonna just start the next part. I don't know why we're gonna get through it, but we'll see. When we put magnesium metal into aqueous hydrochloric acid, the two react. Aqueous magnesium chloride is formed along with gaseous hydrogen. Rory says to me, hey, Russell, I'd really like to see what happens when magnesium is placed in hydrochloric acid. Cool, Rory, I'd love to share with you. but." Came to this lab and darn it, forgot to order any HCl. Well, 
If you understand net ionic equations, you understand the action of the reaction. And if you remember that HCl aqueous is really H plus plus chloride, and magnesium chloride aqueous is magnesium and chloride ions, well, look and lo and behold, chloride is both on the reactant side to the left of the arrow and on the product side to the right of the arrow. And in math, if you had 2x on the left and 2x on the right, you could cancel it out. If you do that, you cancel out the chlorides, you see that chloride is a spectator. It doesn't actually participate in the chemistry itself. And why this is important, you could substitute in, instead of HCl, HNO3, nitric acid. So I see this sad look on Rory's face and I feel so bad, but then I realize, wait a minute, chloride is a spectator, we can use HNO3. So we're gonna talk about on Monday, the action of the reaction, which is what you get out of a net ionic reaction, which is what we're gonna do in lab two. Woohoo, gotta be excited. <laughs> I always try and avoid this explosion, but you're absolutely right. All right, thank you all for being here. Have a great weekend. See you on Monday.